in uh, recognition of the month of Rabi' al Awwal, I've been asked by the Masjid administration to speak on the topic of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the mercy of His Messenger, our Master Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It's obviously a very, very important topic, a topic that can never be overemphasized. Uh, in our times, the very ethos of, of our tradition oftentimes is misrepresented or distorted, obviously by non-Muslims, but even people that claim uh, to be Muslim. Um, and obviously this is problematic, and sometimes we have to get back to the basics. There is a hadith uh, recorded by Imam al-Bayhaqi, in which he says that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu he said, يَأْتِي عَلَى النَّاسِ زَمَانٌ لَا يَبْقَى لَا يَبْقَى مِنْ لَا يَبْقَى مِنَ الْإِسْلَامِ إِلَّا إِسْمُهُ He said that there's going to come a time upon the people where well, nothing will remain from Islam except its name. That people will identify as a Muslim but won't actually know what that actually means. And so it becomes a name without a reality. People will claim to be Muslim but have no knowledge of the Sunnah, the prophetic precedent, or the agreed upon ethos of the Prophet Muhammad. There's a hadith in Tirmidhi in which the Prophet is recorded to have said, Inna deena bada'a ghariban. Indeed, this religion began as something strange. So, in the Hijaz at the time, this type of monotheism was very strange for the Jahadi Arabs. It's Wahdaniya. Then you have halal and haram. This is very strange for them. Gharib. فَسَيُعُودُ كَمَا بَدَعَ And then he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and then this religion will return to be very strange. فَتُوبَ لِلْغُرَبَى Glad tidings to the strangers. So a Muslim doesn't drink alcohol. A Muslim doesn't fornicate. A Muslim dressed modestly. A Muslim believes in God. For a lot of modern people, this is very, very strange. You believe in God? A Muslim believes in objective right and wrong. There are things that are right from a moral standpoint and there are things that are wrong objectively, always. It's not just up to your sort of whims and fancies, this type of critical theory that people are taught in the universities and the academia. Muslims believe, Muslims believe in theological truth and theological <coughs> falsehood. This is very strange. Muslims believe that they're ibadullah, slaves of God. And for a lot of modern people, this is very, very strange. I'm not a slave to anyone. I, I make my own rules. I march to the beat of my own drummer. I'm not a slave. Very, very strange ideas. So then the Prophet ﷺ, he describes who are these people? Who are these ghuraba? These are people who have, uh, who make, make islah. Which, you know, I hesitate to use the word reform, but they repair, they repair what people have corrupted after me from my sunnah. From my sunnah. <coughs> A man came to the Prophet Sallallahu <coughs> in Sahih Muslim and he said, Ya Rasulullah, قُلْ فِي الْإِسْلَامِ قُلْ لِي فِي الْإِسْلَامِ قَوْلًا لَا أَسْأَلُ عَنْهُ أَحَدًا غَيْرًا O Messenger of God, tell me something about Islam that I can ask nobody else except for you. Give me something that only you can tell me. I wanted some sort of prophetic secret from the Prophet So the Prophet he said, قُلْ آمَنْتُ بِاللَّهِ ثُمَّ اسْتَقِمْ He said, say, I believe in Allah and be upright upon that. Be steadfast. Don't be wishy-washy. Be upright. That's it. That's, that's it. That was his entire answer. So, لَا يَقَى مِنَ الْإِسْلَامِ إِلَّا إِسْمُ وَلَا يَقَى مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ إِلَّا رَسْمُ He continues the hadith in Bayhaqi, nothing will remain from the Qur'an except uh, its uh, script. That these are just words on a page that don't have meaning for people. Because people don't study the loha, they don't study linguistics and philology, they don't study tafasir, our vast exegetical tradition. Imam Jafar al-Sadiq, he says, every ayah of the Qur'an has four levels of meaning. The love, the expression, that are known to be awam, the laity, the subtleties, the, uh, or sorry, the, the illusions, the isharat, which are known by the mufassirin and the ulama, then the subtleties, the lata'if, which are known to Al-Anbiya, and then the haqqaiq, the realities of every ayah that are known to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In a hadith that is quoted by Imam uh, At-Tabari, Imam Suyuti, 
to the Prophet ﷺ, he said, every ayah of the Qur'an has a zahir and a batin. Every ayah of the Qur'an has an exoteric meaning and an esoteric meaning. And every harf of the Qur'an has a had, a parameter, and a matla, a point of ascent. The highest meaning of the Qur'an. The Qur'an is polyvalent. The Qur'an has multiple levels of meaning. Imam al-Ghazali, he says in Jawahir al-Qur'an, why are you satisfied by standing on the shore and just collecting wood and, uh, and, and uh, wax? So he likens the Qur'an to a bahar, to an ocean. He says the Qur'an is like an ocean. Imagine the analogy. You're standing on the shore and you just have outward plain meanings. And he says, no, you have to negotiate the waves. The waves are the Arabic ayat of the Qur'an. And people, they learn, they get in boats and they come back and they crash on the shore. You have to keep trying. Eventually you get past the coastline. And then you go and he says, you find islands where you find musk meanings. They're still outward meanings, but they're more sophisticated. And then he says, you dive into the Bahar, dive into the ocean, and you find rubies and pearls, theological verses, verses about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and verses that describe the Sirat al Mustaqim. He called these rubies and pearls. So we have to dive into this ocean of the Qur'an. And then you have uh, the modern Nizami school, uh, which is really interesting and something that we need to get into. You have uh, confessional scholars like Islahi and Farahi who, who uh, engage the Qur'an on the level of its structure and, and point out these amazingly sophisticated things about the Qur'an. And you have non-confessional scholars who are now taking the lead on this. Non-Muslim scholars, many of them are Catholic, like Kuypers and Farron and Neil Robinson. Farron wrote a book on Surah Al-Baqarah, where he says the entire surah is one big chiasmus. The entire surah has concentric composition around a central pivot, meaning the beginning of the surah mirrors the end of the surah. The second, the second part of the surah mirrors the second to last part. The third part of the surah mirrors the third to the last part. Until all, it all sort of comes in together in the pivot of the surah, in the middle of the surah. This is incredible, sophisticated work. You have to imagine the Prophet ﷺ is reciting these ayat along with the ayat of other surah, and he's not writing anything down. How is he keeping track of this? This is a wahi. Two of the greatest names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ar-Rahman and Ar-Rahim. Ar-Rahman, both of these are on uh, emphatic nominal forms. Ar-Rahman means something like indiscriminately compassionate, universally loving. And the Quraysh before the Prophet sallallahu the Meccans, they did not refer to Allah as Ar-Rahman. In Surah Al-Furqan, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands the Prophet sallallahu tell them to make sajda to Ar-Rahman. And they say, Ma Ar-Rahman? Who is Rahman? In the tree of Hudaybiyah, they were Bismillah Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. And the Mushrikeen, they said, we don't know these names. Strike them out. Say, Bismika Allahumma. They thought Ar-Rahman was some human teacher of the Prophet sallallahu Ar-Rahman is written of in rabbinical literature. This is a name that was known by Ahl al-Kitab. The indiscriminately compassionate, a, a, a name that denotes a type of mahabba that is am, that is universal, cosmopolitan. And then you have Ar-Rahim, which is more focused, the infinite, the, the intimately loving. You have a name that is, that is am and a name that is more khas, that is more focused. And of course this formula, the basmala, it prefaces 113 of the 114 surah of the Qur'an. These names are etymologically related to the word Rahmah, which means compassion or mercy or love. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Qur'an, Surah Al-An'am, Ayah 54, When you come into contact with those who believe in our signs, say, peace be upon you. This is what a Muslim does. I've been to academic conferences, and I meet other Muslims, and they don't say, Salaamu Alaikum. You can't put me into a box. SubhanAllah. This is what a Muslim does. Salam al qawli wa rabbi rahim Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran that this is, a, this is a word that's given by a loving Lord. This is the greeting of the people of paradise, but apparently it's not so in vogue amongst a lot of people. It's not fashionable. But after he says this, وَإِذَا جَاءَكَ الَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِآيَاتِنَا فَقُلْ سَلَامٌ عَلَيْكُمْ كَتَبَ رَبَّكُمْ عَلَى نَفْسِهِ الرَّحْمَةِ Your Lord has inscribed upon His own self mercy. In the next surah, Surah Al-A'raf, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, عَذَابِي أُصِيبُ بِهِ مَنْ أَشَاءَ That I cause my punishment to afflict whomever I will. 
ورحمتي وسعت كل شيء. But my mercy encompasses everything. That rahma is his dominant, if you can say, personality trait of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is rahma. One of my favorite hadith in Sahih Muslim, reported by Anas ibn Malik. He says, the Prophet says, Allah ashaddu faraha li tawbati abdihi hina yatubu ilayhi. This is how he begins the hadith. He says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is more extreme in his joy. More extreme in his joy when a slave makes tawbah to him than one of you who's traveling in the desert and loses his conveyance and all of his food and his drink is gone. And then he says, فَأَجِسَ minha Until he reaches a point of losing all hope. Yes, all hope is lost. Enters into a state of total despair. He's going to die a painful, horrible death all alone. And then the Prophet ﷺ, he said he sees some shame and he goes there and he sees his conveyance and he grabs the halter of his conveyance. And he says, Allahumma anta abdi wa ana rabbuk. He says, in his rapturous joy, akhta'a min shiddatil farah. In his rapturous joy, he says, Oh Allah, you are my slave and I am your Lord. Akhta'a. He made a mistake. Because of the severity of the joy, overcome with joy. The Prophet ﷺ said, Allah ashaddu farahan. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is more overjoyed when a sinner makes tawbah to him than this man is when he grabs the halter of his, of his conveyance. This is our Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala. In a hadith in Bukhari, the Prophet ﷺ, he says that, uh, he says that, there was, there was, there was a, a battle of some sort and a woman was running around. She had lost her young son. She was absolutely hysterical. And then she sees her son and picks him up and begins to kiss and hug and breastfeed him. And then the Prophet ﷺ, he says to the Sahaba that are in the vicinity, he says, do you see that woman? They say, yes. He said, can you imagine her throwing her son in a fire? La wallahi. They said, no, by Allah we can't. Allahu arhamu bi hadihi li waladiha. Allah is more merciful to his servants than this woman is to her child. These terms, you know, his father, son, children of God, these terms are abrogated because they were literalized by Christians. The figurative meanings are still there. These analogies are still there. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is more merciful to his servants than this mother is to her child. Think about that one. The hadith in Ahmad, Ar-Rahimuna yarhamuhum ar-Rahman. The most compassionate shows compassion to those who show compassion. Show compassion to those on the earth, and the one in heaven will show you compassion. You have Muslim youth that study philosophy in the university, and they study people like Nietzsche, who talked about a transvaluation of all values. That's how he put it. He believed that Christian values were detrimental to society. And the most detrimental virtue or value was compassion. This is what he believed. He used to sign his letters, the Antichrist. There was a Muslim doctor who told me a Muslim woman came in one time and she had a tattoo on her arm that said in Arabic, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. From Nietzsche. You know this man's final sane act when he was living in Turin, Italy? He was walking around, a man was beating his horse. He ran with tears in his eyes and started hugging the horse. How ironic, his final act was an act of compassion towards a horse. Then he lost his mind and never recovered. Trust Allah and his messenger. Their words are true. Don't listen to these deranged philosophers. In Bukhari, famous hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, wa so he says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we know this famous hadith related by Salman al farisi that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala divided his mercy into 100 parts and he said one part out of 100 into the world. And it's through this one part that all of creation displays mutual affection, love, and mercy. What about the other 99 that's reserved to show up to his ibad on the Yawm al-Qiyamah? In a hadith Qudsi, the Prophet Sallallahu he says that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says this in Tibbidi قال الله تعالى يا يا ابن آدم إنك ما دعوتني ورجوتني O child of Adam 
As long as you call on me and have hope on me, خَفَرْتُ لَكَ عَلَى مَا كَانَ مِنْكَ وَلَا أُبَالِي As long as you call on me and have raja, have hope in me, I will forgive you وَلَا أُبَالِي And I do not mind. In the Quran, قُلْ يَا عِبَالِي Say to my servants, الَّذِينَ أَزْرَفُوا عَلَى أَنفُسِهِمْ who have, who have completely transgressed against their own souls. La taqnatu min rahmatillah. Never, dis, never despair of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Inna Allah yaghfuru dhunuba jani'ah. Allah forgives all sins. Inna hu huwa al-ghafuru rahim He is constantly forgiving, the intimately loving. The ulama say, arja ayatin fi kitabillah. This is the most hopeful ayah in the entire Quran, the Ahl al-Kaba'ir, for the people of major or mortal sin. Just have istiqamah. Do the best you can. And when you slip, we make Tawbah. We make Tawbah. To Tawbah, Tawbah means to turn, to reorient yourself. Towards a Tawbah. The one who's constantly reorienting himself towards you in no anthropomorphic way. And then we have hope. We have Raja. One of my teachers told me, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he called two men out of the hellfire. And he said to them, okay, go back to hell now. One of them turned around very reluctantly and started walking back slowly while looking over his shoulder. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to this man, and Allah knows best, so why do you keep looking back at me, as it were? And he said, you know, you called me out of hell, I had hope I didn't have to go back. He said, you're right, go to Jannah. And then the other man, he turned around quickly and sprinted towards Jahannam. Sprint. And Allah said to him, why do you sprint towards the hellfire? And the man said, you know, I lived my entire life disobeying you in disobedience of you. This time I really wanted to make sure I obeyed you. And I, I have hope eventually I'll come out of Jahannam. And Allah said, you're right. Go to Jannah. This is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Arham al rahimin He is the most merciful of those who show mercy. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is a reflection of his Lord. وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَكِ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ we did not send you except as a mercy to the alamin, the jinn and ins. This statement is ithbat ba'd nafiyin. It is an affirmation after negation in, in grammar, which is a very, very strong statement to make. In Imam Tantawi, he says to you, rahmatan is maf'ud bin ajlihi, an accusative of purpose, revealing an intentionality or internal reason. That we did not send you except out of an incredible mercy to all the worlds. That the Prophet ﷺ is the means, the sabab, the wasila of our guidance, which will land us in paradise, inshallah ta'ala. قُلْ بِفَضِلِ اللَّهِ وَبِرَحْمَتِهِ فَبِذَارِكَ فَلْيَفْرَحُوا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Qur'an. Say, for the sake of Allah's grace and His mercy, His rahmah, in the Prophet ﷺ is called rahmah. They should be overjoyed. Let them have farah. Let them have a great joy. أَنَا نَبِيُّ rahma In Sahih Muslim, I am the prophet of mercy. Ana rahmatun muhda. I am a gifted mercy. <coughs> now you might read in secular history source, historical sources, and confessional sources, that the Prophet sallallahu he fought in battles, he conquered Mecca, and that's true. That's what he did. But we have to get the whole picture, get the full story. Imam Izzuddin ibn Abd salam has written a very short treatise <coughs> called Bidai to Sulfi Taftil al Rasul. And this was taught here by our esteemed colleague Imam Tahir Anwar, may Allah preserve him. And so he, he, he mentions here, Imam Izzuddin, 40 distinctive virtues and characteristics that belong only to the Prophet Muhammad. So, number 30, he says, another distinction is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent him as a mercy to all beings, so that he gave him, so that, so that he gave respite to the rebels of his community, and did not hasten their punishment, even though they asked the punishment to be hastened, so that they were preserved, contrary to the prophets before him. That the other prophets, while their prophets were still alive, their communities were destroyed. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ لِيُعَذِّبَهُمْ وَأَنْتَ فِيهِمْ that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to punish them while you are amongst them. For example, on the day of Uhud, the Prophet وسلم, and this is a day when he lost many, many of his companions, beloved companion, Mus'ab ibn Umar, his uncle Hamza was martyred, his body was mutilated, they, they cannibalized his body. 
<coughs> and the Prophet وسلم, he suffered injuries to his face, his blood pouring down his face. They see him with his hands raised to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Sahaba said, ah, this is his game over now. He's making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with a bloody face. The malaika are going to descend. These Quraysh are done. So now listen, what does he say? Allahumma hadi qawmi to innahum la ya'lamun. Oh God, guide my people for they don't know. Guide my people. In such an occasion when beloved ones, his ahibba, are falling down beside him, dying, being mutilated, blood pouring down his face, he prefers the guidance of his enemies over their destruction. The conquest of Mecca. All of the leaders on the day of Uhud from the Mushrikeen, they became Muslim eventually. Because the Prophet ﷺ, he did not give up on them. And as he was coming into Mecca with his army, Sa'ad ibn Ubadah, he was shouting at Abu Sufyan, who was standing by the gate of the Haram, Al-Yawma, Yawmul Malhama, Adallallahu Quraishan. Today is a day of slaughter, the debasement of the Quraysh. And Abu Sufyan was full of fear, and the mushrikeen are wondering, he's well within his rights to punish everybody. Well within his rights. Today is a day of slaughter, the debasement of the Quraysh. The Prophet ﷺ was further back, and he was told, this is what Sa'ad is saying. And he said, he, he, he sent a rider up to Sa'ad. He said, don't say that. And, and, and he, he, so he went to Sa'ad. And he said, the Prophet is saying, don't say that. Sa'ad ibn Ubadah said, I don't believe you. I'm going to keep saying it. So he came back to the Prophet ﷺ. He said, he, said, he doesn't believe me. And the Prophet ﷺ took his blessed imama. He said, give this to Sa'ad. Tell him to stop saying that. But take the liwa, take the standard he's holding and give it to his son. Right? So the genius of the Prophet ﷺ, honoring his son, the son of Sa'ad. So the Prophet ﷺ, he passes by the haram, al-yawma yawmul marhama, yu'izzullahu Quraysh. Today is a day of mercy, the exaltation of the Quraysh, the exaltation of the Quraysh. And then the Prophet ﷺ, he says, لا تثريب عليكم اليوم. What Yusuf ﷺ had said to his brethren, to his brethren, in, in exegetical study, this is called a typology. You have someone in the past, a historical figure who does some sort of action, and then you have someone in the future mirroring or foreshadowing that event. The Prophet ﷺ, like Yusuf ﷺ, was cast out of Mecca, like Yusuf was cast out of Mecca, because they were jealous of him, they tried to kill him. He was, he was physically and internally beautiful, gorgeous. He goes to a different city, he becomes head of state, he comes back, he has power over his brethren and magnanimously forgives them. Al-Yawma, he's la tathriba alaykum al-yawm. Yawfirullahu lakum. There is no blemish on you, Allah has forgiven you. Do not displace the centrality of the Prophet ﷺ in our deen. Anas ibn Malik reported, لَمَّا كَانَ يَوْمُ الَّذِي دَخَلَ فِيهِ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ الْمَدِينَةَ أَضَاءَ مِنْهَا كُلُّ شَيْءٍ he said, when the Prophet ﷺ re uh, arrived in Mecca, everything in the city was illuminated. And when he had passed away to the mercy of his Lord, everything became dim and dark. We have not yet even dusted off the dust from our hands after burying the Prophet ﷺ when we began to feel a change in our hearts. Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, he lasted barely one year. A smell of burning liver was coming from his breath. He says, what is the smell? He says, I have shok for the, for the Prophet ﷺ. I am longing for the Prophet ﷺ. It's consuming me. And he was sincere. In the hadith in Tibmidi, we were told the Prophet ﷺ went out of his house one night. Fi sa'atin la yukhruju fiha. At a time, very late in the night, when he'd never gone out before. Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, he noticed that the Prophet ﷺ had left his house, that the Prophet was outside. So he goes outside as well. And so the Prophet sees him, and he says, Ma ja'abik, ya Abu Bakr, what has brought you out during this very late hour? Abu Bakr says, Kharaj tu alqa Rasulullah. I have left in order to see the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. To look into his blessed face. Wa taslima alayhi. And they give salams to him. Imagine you have a son or daughter who's studied overseas for five years or something. You haven't seen them for five years. You're sitting on your porch and a car drives up. And you're looking at this, who's in this car? And so you see your child, your beloved child. What would your body do? Immediately would rise up and rush towards your beloved. 
This is what happens to Abu Bakr Siddiq. He's sitting in his house in the middle of the night. He glances out the window or something, looks into his courtyard. He sees his beloved walking by. Immediately he bolts from his house. Why did you come? I just came to see you, look at your face, give you salam. This type of love. Last hadith in Tirmidhi. Imam Tirmidhi records the Prophet Wasallam. He said, Man kana lahu faratani min ummati. A person who loses two children, who loses two children, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, on account of that, will enter this person into Jannah. What about someone who loses only one child? He said, even if they lose one child. Then she said, فَمَنْ لَمْ يَكُنْ لَهُ فَرَطٌ مِنْ أُمَّتِكِ What about if they lose no children? فَأَنَا فَرَطٌ بِأُمَّتِي لَا يُصَابُ بِمِثْلِي Then the loss of me is devastating enough for my ummah. So yes, even if you lose no children, but we have to feel a sense of loss that we lost our Habib صلى الله عليه وسلم. We have to feel that sense of loss. We just have to appreciate the tremendous value of the Prophet ﷺ. And inshallah ta'ala, it will be a means of, for us to enter into Jannah.